start and we can listen to our speakers. Um, I welcome everyone. This is our first event of a spring semester. So we're doing all our events um, virtually again, as I'm sure everyone is now really used to. Um, and today we'll hear the results of the research from our two McNally uh, fellows um, who were awarded the fellowships to do summer research. It was not summer travel this past year, as I'm sure everyone understands uh, why. So I was talking with uh, both the speakers and we um, decided that we will have um, Rushka speak first. She will give her paper and then we'll allow a few minutes to have questions just on her paper. And then Catherine Pierpont will speak afterward in the second half of the hour. And then we'll have questions on her talk afterward. And we'll try to keep it to just about an hour long um, event. So um, again, our first speaker then will be uh, Rushika. Haig, who is a grad student in, his, in the history department here at the U, and she's working on her dissertation on the Canepa Portolan. Her areas of interest include medieval maps, trade and travel, and the medieval church. Um, she and her husband, Chris, have written two books on Nicolette Island, um, where they live with their two daughters, a dog, four chickens, two parakeets, and a hamster. <laughs> Rushika um, is currently an adjunct in the history department at Bethel University. Okay, so I will mute and I'll let you take over. All right, thank you. All right, um, I'm just gonna launch in and start talking and then I will share my screen momentarily as I, I get into my topic here. Catherine Delano Smith says the first task of a map historian is to identify the circumstances leading to the type of map in question. And this is what I have been trying to do with the Portland chart made by the Genoese map maker, Albino de Canepa, and it was made in 1491. This Portland chart, which many of you are familiar, uh, 1489, I'm sorry, I misspoke there. This Portland chart is one um, many of you are familiar with and it is one of five that is housed in the James Ford Bell Library. And it certainly is one of the show pieces because it is an excellent example of a highly decorated late medieval Portland chart. Tony Campbell writes, to the historian of late medieval and early modern Europe, Pian Cartography, the Portland charts are fundamental documents if mysterious in their origin and precocious in their precision. Portland charts were the most geographically realistic maps of their time. And the advent of the Portland chart was one of the most important turning points in the whole history of cartography. There's a fair amount of literature on Portland charts and medieval map making in general, but delving into the literature shows that almost every aspect of Portland charts is hotly debated. There is no consensus about the origin of Portland charts, their construction, or their uses. A recent book even questions whether they are medieval, though having read it, I, I think his evidence is slim and we really can't take that one seriously. The early extent, earliest extant Portland charts date from the late 13th century, though some wish to put that, push that, that date back even earlier. Their origins are fiercely debated and they seem to come out of nowhere. They are a complete break with tradition and they do not appear to come out of previous medieval map making traditions such as Teo maps or Mapa Mundi. And I'm gonna share my screen now so you can see examples of these. All right, let's see if I can get it to advance there. There we go. All right. Oops. All right. So what you see here are two examples of some of the earliest maps. These are known as TO maps, and they take their name from the fact that they make a little T within the circle of an O there, and it shows the three known continents, Asia, Europe, and Africa. These eventually evolve into more sophisticated map I mundi, like this one. This is the Hereford map from about 1300. It's one of the largest map I mundi and is extremely beautiful. If you have a chance, go and look at the link um, for this. They have sort of an amazing, amazing display and sort of show layers of the map. But this is a different kind of medieval map, very different than the Portland charts. And it really has, um, 
a much more stylized representation of the world. Jerusalem is at the center of the world. And in many ways, this has absolutely no relationship to the Portland charts that we're talking about. Um, the Portland charts continue to fascinate historians, map makers, geographers, and collectors because of the amazing accuracy of their measurements and coastlines. Portland charts cor correct the traditional exaggeration of the longitudinal extent of the Mediterranean that is seen on maps from antiquity and is one of the reasons they continue to fascinate. Um, even up to the middle of the last century, there existed no more accurate representations of the Black Sea on those portolans, and we will actually return to the Black Sea. And they were so accurate that a more exact outline of the Mediterranean was not produced until the 18th century. So this next slide shows you a portolan chart and then the actual outlines of the Mediterranean. You can see how how close they are and how accurate they are. And this is one of the things that continues to amaze um, people when they look at these is that how exactly did they get such accurate outlines? So pre-1500 Portland charts have certain distinctive features. They were drawn on vellum made from calfskin or sometimes parchment from sheep or goat skins. Many of the charts still show the shape of the animal hide. They were soaked in alum and lime to remove the hair and then the skin was stretched on a frame and scraped. Chalk was sometimes added to whiten the skin. And one of the distinctive features of the chart is a network of eight, 16, or 32 lines known as room lines. These lines radiate, radiate out from the center of a hidden circle or sometimes two circles and from nodes on the circle circumference. And I'm gonna to return to these again when we actually look at the portal in, um, of Canepa. The names of important coastal cities are written per perpendicular to the coastline. And this seems to be so the names could be read as the chart was rotated. Portland charts concentrated their detail on the coastlines and cities along the coast for the most part. The names of the ports are usually written in black with important ports in red. Few details inland are given and symbols and emblems such as flags identify important areas and who controls them. Some Portland charts contain decorative elements but there are in general few details in the interior. Most of the detail is on the coastlines. And I'll show you here, this is one of the earliest Portland charts, the Cart Pisan, um, somewhere between 1275 and 1300. There's some debate about the date for it, but you can see the shape of the hide still. And this one is a much simpler one. It doesn't have the elaborate decorations that we'll see later, but you can see the room lines crisscrossing it the outlines and all the names along the coastline there. Later Portolan charts add wind or compass roses and scales. And the first scale bars appear on charts in the early 14th century and the number of names along the coast also increases. After 1350, the different places where charts were made start to develop their own traditions. And this is one of the things I've been looking at. In the 14th century, portal and atlases, manuscript map books appear, which allowed for more details, coastlines, descriptions, and place names. Portal and charts continue to be produced into the 18th century. So the Canepa portal in bears all the distinctive marks of portal and charts, an elaborate network of room lines and two circles, and highly accurate coastlines. The chart is made of two pieces of vellum that have been joined. You can see the join there at the middle, and it's quite large, larger than many portolans, about three feet by four feet. Unlike some other charts where you can see the neck, like the one we just looked at, um, this one is a large rectangle. It may have been trimmed to give it that shape. The chart is highly decorated and signed and dated 1489 by Albino de Canepa of Genoa. There are holes on all four sides of the map indicating that it was probably attached or maybe attached to a wooden frame at some point. And the Canepa is a beautiful example of late medieval Portolan because of its rich details and colorful decorations. The chart is colored in red, blue, and green inks. The Alps, um, which you can see right by the city of Genoa there, are shown in green, red, and white. And another colorful element is the Red Sea, traditionally colored in deep red. Major cities are marked by castles and identified by their flags. The largest of these, of course, is Genoa, and I'll give you a close-up detail of that in just a moment, which is significantly larger than nearby Venice. Seven-tenths shown in blue and red are found on the chart, but without any identifying markers. 
There is some debate over the purpose and use of Portland charts. Chet Van Duzer writes that Portland charts were practical instruments of navigation with carefully drawn coastlines and indications of coastal cities, but literal or no details about inland areas. However, cartographers also offered more elaborate versions with texts about and painted images of sovereign cities and creatures. Some of these deluxe charts were not used for navigation aboard ships, but were collected and displayed by royalty and nobles. Some scholars point to a difference between Portland charts and Portolani pilot books. Um, one Kelly uh, argues that the latter were meant for daily use on deck in all weathers, and he believes the surviving Portland charts were expensive and probably kept in the cabin's, captain's cabin for general orientation. Um, another map historian, Harvey, goes a step further and even suggests that surviving charts might have been aid memoir or library copies that were never taken to sea. A recent article by Kevin Sheehan follows this idea and argues that Portland charts were aesthetic cartography. He argues that the charts were cultural and aesthetic objects for wealthy and learned people to show off their area tradition. And I have become more and more convinced that this is the category into which our Canepa falls. Um, some scholars link the emergence of these sea charts with a revival of commercial activity and trade, particularly that of Genoa and Venice. They point to the fact that the earliest charts concentrate on the Mediterranean Black Seas, areas where Venice and Genoa traded. Venetian mer merchants formed communities in Constantinople as early as the 10th century. And following the Crusades, Pisan and Genoese merchants established trading posts in the Near East. For the Genoese, trade was the lifeblood of the city. Many of us, of course, know the famous saying, I am Genoese, therefore a merchant. By the late 1260s, the Genoese had established their colony at Haffa on the Black Sea. And by the late 13th century, the Venetians and Genoese had an outpost at Tana on the Don River mouth in the Sea of Assal. The trading connection here is clearly shown on the Canepa Portland by the many Genoese flags circling the Black Sea but I'm going to propose that there's more to it than just civic pride. But to read and understand the Knepp of Portolan, it is necessary to understand the history of Genoese trade. So this is my two minute dash through Genoese trade. The history of Genoa was dominated by the sea. Leonardo da Vinci wrote, speak to the Genoese about the sea. Genoa faces the sea and is surrounded by steep hills and mountains. Thomas Allison Kirk describes it as an amphitheater centered around the watery stage of its circular port. Genoa, unlike other Italian cities, was not surrounded by a fertile plain, but it did mark the beginning of the shortest, shortest overland route between the Western Mediterranean and Northern Italy. Genoa also has the largest port in the Mediterranean. Between the First Crusade and the War of Chioggia against Venice, um, 1378 to 81, the Genoese built an empire stretching from the Levant through the Aegean to the Black Sea and the coasts of Spain and the Atlantic. Genoa obtained its first overseas colonies as a result of the First Crusade, and by the first decade of the 12th century, Genoa had colonies in Antioch, Caesarea, Acre, and Tripoli. By the end of the 13th century, Genoa had colonies around the Black Sea and the Sea of Asaf in the Aegean and on Cyprus. One of Genoese um, Genoese, the Genoese had rivalries with many people, the Pisans um, were one of them, but the rivalry they had with Venice proved to be um, more enduring and perhaps more explosive, which is no doubt one of the reasons it's highlighted and commemorated on the Canepa Portolan. The Golden Bull of 1082 gave the Venetians the right to trade freely in the Byzantine Empire, but in 1156 the Genoese secured trading rights in Constantinople. The tumultuous relationship between these two rivals was played out in that city, and in 1171, Venetians destroyed the Genoese quarter in Constantinople. Just nine years later, both merchant communities came under attack when the emperor ordered the massacre of Venetian and Genoese merchants in 1182. After Venice took over the ruling of the Byzantine Empire of the Fourth, Fourth Crusade, the Genoese gave naval support to help restore the Byzantine Empire after the Fourth Crusade, and Oh, I'm sorry, help restore the Greeks against the Venetians. There we go. In return, they received a trading colony in Galata with access to grain, wax, slaves, and the furs of the Black Sea region. In 1266, the Mongols ceded Kaffa to the Genoese and Tana on the Sea of Asaf to the Genoese and Venetians with permission to build warehouses and consulates. 
and from these outposts, the Genoese strove to control the traffic in the Black Sea. But with the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453, the Genoese access to the Black Sea's its Black Sea colonies was cut off. Genoese trade slumped from the 1420s to the 1490s as Venice dominated Mediterranean commerce. The 15th century was a tumultuous one for Gen the Genoese. Genoa was, was racked by internal strife and fell under the dominion of foreign rulers. First the French from 1396 to 1409 and then the Milanese. The Genoese economy changed in the later 15th and early 16th centuries and their trade became centered in the Western Mediterranean. The Canepa Portolan is made at this pivotal point in Genoese history when trade is shifting from the Eastern to the Western Mediterranean. Little is known about our map maker, Albino de Canepa, other than his own declaration on the extant Portolan charts that bear his name. Important chart makers were known by name, but there are many Portolan charts that were unsigned and undated. And so the fact that Albino de Canepa signs his name so prominently might indicate that he was a well-known chart maker whose name was recognizable and therefore prestigious. And the fact that he tells us that these charts, um, that he makes these charts in Genoa certainly does indicate a pride in this city, but might also show that he belonged to a certain group or school of cartography. So the one I've been uh, focusing on is the Portolan housed in the James Ford Bell Library from 18, 1489, but there is an earlier chart from 1480 at La Società Geografica Italiana in Rome. And a comparison of these two charts made some nine years apart, I think provides some insight into Canepa and his work. So this is the chart from 1480 on the left, um, and then the 1489 Canepa. So the 1480 chart reads, similarly, Albinos de Canepa made this chart in the city of Genoa in the year 1480 in the month of March. This inscription is very similar to the one on the 1489 chart, one of the main differences really being the date. The 1480 chart is not as well preserved as the 1489 chart. There are tears on the left side and it is missing a right flap where it would have been fixed to a rod that many documents like this were wrapped around to avoid folding. Um, the ink is more faded and it is not as large. It's made out of one um, hide of sheep vellum. Um, like other Portolan charts like the Card of Pisana that I showed earlier or the 1339 chart of Angelino Dolce, this like those shows the shape of the hide, including the neck. But like the 1489 chart, this one shows a detailed Mediterranean Black Sea region, as well as North Africa and the Baltic Sea. In the Atlantic are fabled islands such as Antilia and the fortunate islands of St. Brendan. I will pull up details to show you some of these things. At first examination, the charts seem very similar in style. The Atlas Mountains are traced in green in North Africa. The Alps are depicted in similar shape and fashion. The shapes of Ireland and England and Scotland are the same, both much less known and detailed than the Mediterranean region or even Spain. Both charts show the city of Granada still under Muslim control in 1480 and 1489. And the general outlines are done in a very similar style. But there are some intriguing differences. I said I would return to room lines, and this is the moment where I'm going to have you, as best you can with my images, look at the room lines. The 1489 Portland has five scales. Um, those are the scales that you see there sort of in areas on the side in yellow and blue and green and red. Um, but the 1480 chart doesn't have those scales. The room lines crisscross both the charts, but they are not the same. They don't come together at the same points. And some scholars have speculated that room lines were followed to set lines of navigation. But if the lines on these two charts do not correspond, this might indicate and support the alternate theory that these lines were put in as a copying aid and a guide to draw in the details of land masses and water. If so, then this might confirm 
that these charts were intended as aesthetic cartography rather than navigational tools. On both charts, Canepa shows his beloved city of Genoa as larger and more elaborate than rival and neighbor Venice. So on the one side, you can see how it looks on the 1480 chart. Um, you see the Alps there, they are missing the green. And then the 1489 chart, um, even more elaborate and detailed, you see the towers of Genoa with the Genoese flag there and next to it, Venice with the Venetian lion on, on their flag. And I mean, that message is very clear and the same on both charts. Genoa is, is clearly much better than our rival Venice. Um, but this brings us to one of the main differences between the 1480 and 1489 charts. On the 1489 chart, Genoese flags circle the Black Sea, staked out along Genoese colonies and trade centers like Tana, Kaffa, and Para near Constantinople. These Genoese flags seem to go along with Canepa's depiction of Genoa as larger than Venice and his signature that explicitly states that he made his chart in the city of Genoa. Seen this way, the chart is a celebration of Genoese pride and history. Canepa is po possibly following Genoese chroniclers who were sort of notoriously selective about what parts of Genoese history they included in their chronicles. By 1489, Genoa is no longer the power it once was, and the colonies outlined in the Black Sea have been lost for years. Due to the advance of the Ottoman Empire, Genoa lost Para, its outpost near Constantinople in 1453, and Kaffa in the Black Sea in 1475. The chart celebrates Genoa as it was at its height, not as it is in 1489. But if you look at the 1480 chart, there are no Genoese flags in the Black Sea. In fact, one of the key features in decorations on the 1480 chart are actually two kings and an elephant drawn just below the Atlas Mountains in North Africa. So here's the, um, the two depictions of the Black Sea. And so on the 1489 Canepa, we have all those Genoese flags that have intrigued everyone for so long. But if you look at the 1481's uh, chart, the flags are absent there. What it does have is this. And it's this little detail at the bottom that I wanna look at now. These figures at the bottom of the 1480 Canepa recall another medieval map. They are clearly modeled on or inspired by the Catalan Atlas of 1375. The maker of the Catalan Atlas was Abraham Kresk, a Jew from Palma, who described himself as a master of Mapai Mundi in compasses. And this atlas was made for Charles V of France. This atlas was produced by the Majorcan Cartographic School and by the middle of the 14th century, Mallorca was a major center of production of Portolan charts. Map anchors of one nationality often traveled to and worked in other centers of map making. For example, the Genoese cartographer Angelino Dulcert lived and worked in Palma, Mallorca. Genoese map makers were influenced by the Mallorcan school as their maps tended to be more highly decorated than other Italian maps. But the presence of these kings on the 1480 chart by Canepa seems to confirm that he was influenced by the Mallorcan map making style. Did he know about the Catalan Atlas or had the inclusion of these kings and the elephant become a fixture of Mallorcan school of cartography? Either way, the 1480 Canepa Portolan copies the kings and their names, Rey de Organa and Rey de Nubia, and this rather charming little elephant. The Canepa, uh, the 1489 Canepa Portolan also bears a striking resemblance to the 1466 chart by another Mallorcan cartographer, Petrus Roselli, which I think further underscores the influence of the Mallorcan school on Canepa. And you can see here, as you put the two of them side by side, that the outline of the Atlas Mountains follows almost exactly between Canepa's 1489 chart and the Roselli chart. And you see that he's also borrowed the tents 
from Roselli, these tents in blue and yellow and red. And sort of the, the general style and outline is very similar here too. And so I think if you look at all of these and com start comparing them, you can see that he was very influenced by the Mallorcan school, maybe had gone there, maybe maybe had done, done some work there, but he's borrowing things from other people and other maps. But let's return to those flags. If Canepa's intention, I'll go back, give me a second here. If Canepa's intention in placing Genoese flags in the Black Sea is just civic pride, why are they not also present on the 1480 chart? One possibility is that this represents an evolution of Canepa's style. In the nine years between the two charts, his map making skills have developed and become more sophisticated. Um, if you look at the bigger ones. Um, the lines on the 1489 chart are crisper, the detail a little bit finer, though this also might be because it's just better preserved. And another explanation might be that Albino de Canepa was commissioned by different patrons for each of these charts. We do know that Portland charts were highly valued. Americo Vespucci played 130 Ducati de Oro di Marco for Gabriel de Valesca's ornate chart of 1439. In Paolo Rivelli's examination of Genoese probate documents from 1384 to 1404 indicates that charts were considered to be quite valuable and therefore passed on and mentioned in wills. Because of the high cost to create maps like this, map makers sought wealthy patrons. If each of these charts was a work commissioned by a specific patron, that might explain the differences between the two charts. Perhaps the intention of the 1480 chart was to create a beautiful chart that brought to mind the richness of the Catalan Atlas. This chart also has names of countries and areas drawn in red, such as Granada, Dalmatia, and the Atlas Mountains, which those aren't specifically written out on the 1489 chart. So maybe the focus for this one is more on showing the world. The 1489 Canepa is composed of two skins put together, making it larger than the 1480 chart, and in fact, many Portland charts. And this larger size, of course, would have required more materials, and it might indicate a very wealthy patron who was willing to pay extra for a larger map. The Genoese flags and their locations in the Black Sea perhaps point to what type of patron. The flags are not just an indication of Genoese civic pride but are placed in significant Genoese trading centers in the Black Sea. So I propose that this chart was made for a wealthy Genoese merchant family that wished to ce celebrate and commemorate the origin of their family's power and wealth by showing the areas where they once held sway. So it seems that Albino Canepa was a cartographer who worked with various styles and was influenced by the Mariorcan School of Cartography and used different, sort of was content to borrow little pieces from other map makers um, to create a style that was at once his own, but at the same time heavily influenced by others. And that he created these charts for wealthy pa uh, patrons. He borrowed from different map makers, incorporating Roselli's red, yellow, and blue tents into the 1489 chart and the kings and the elephant of the Catalan Atlas into the 1480 chart, perhaps to match the style and intentions of his patrons. Great, thank you, Rushika. That was uh, really great. And it's really wonderful to see these images. Um, so we have Let's see if we have a question right now. Um, we can take a, a question for a couple minutes and then we'll um, hear our second paper. Questions or comments? And if you want to put them in chat or if you want to ask them. Yes. Razor, go ahead. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Ryerson. Me? Okay, sorry. Um, well, I think this is um, uh, I think this is an interesting technique of comparing these two charts, and I was unaware of the 1480 Canepa. Uh, 
where where is it where is it held at the moment it's, it's in rome at the italian geographic society and yeah it's not as well known though interestingly enough they seem to know about the one that we have um and it hasn't been shown until very recently um just i think it was just a year ago they did an exhibit in Rome about, um, you know, the Mediterranean cartography. And that was the first time it had ever been shown um, outside of the Geographic Society. Interesting. So uh, one of the things we were supposed to think about is, you know, problems that came up because we couldn't travel. And I have to say, wow, thank you to the wonder of the internet that I'm actually able, was able to get some of these images. It's so, fabulous, uh, particularly in light of the fact that you could not travel. Uh, <laughs> I'm wondering if you if you have any candidate as patron, uh, and I'm thinking that something as valuable as as either of these, but certainly the 1489 Canepa, would would likely have figured in a will. Um, you know, someone passing it on. I can't imagine that that it wasn't a valued uh, uh, item in someone's uh, uh, fortune. So. What about uh, what about late fifteenth century Genoese merchant families for uh, patronage? Um, unfortunately, at this point, and this is sort of the next direction that I'm heading in is is trying to see if I can possibly figure out a good candidate for this. But right now, I just have wild speculation. Um, but I mean, I don't know if it would even make sense to look at some of like the best families, like you know, uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure yet, I guess is my short, the short version of that, but that's the next um, avenue of inquiry. Yeah. Uh, see what I can find. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Applause. Um, and uh, now we can hear from our um, next uh, speaker, who will be Catherine Pierpont. She she is a graduate student um, studying sex work in the high middle ages in Southern France, um, who focuses on questions of what defines sex work in the middle ages and how engaging in sex work changed social perceptions of one's gender and sexuality. Catherine uh, is currently an instructor for the Medieval Cities course and lives with her partner under the benevolent overlordship of her cat, Franny. <laughs> Sorry, Michelle, didn't realize you'd have to read that. I thought it'd just be sort of put in a corner somewhere, but um, my overlord is in fact sitting right next to me. So I guess I guess it's sort of spot on. Yeah, no, it's great to hear about the parakeets, overlord <laughs> cats and dogs that everyone is uh, cohabitating with. <laughs> yeah, she has not Zoom bombed yet, but maybe today will be the day. Um, okay, so... Uh, I am also going to kind of dig us really deep into some maps here. So it was really great to see Rushika's presentation, a very different take on maps than uh, what I'm about to give you, but really awesome. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Rushika, for sharing your work. It was awesome. So um, because I can't name a talk without coming up with something ridiculous. My talk is nobody puts jongleurs in a corner. And uh, in the time-honored tradition of historians, I'm going to find a way to take a very interesting and titillating topic like sex work and make it incredibly tedious. So just if you can bear with me through this, we're going to get deep in on some urban geography that I think is pretty exciting. Um, Hopefully you will as well. So I'm gonna start actually, before I get any further, I'm gonna start with a little bit of what I did before uh, the McNally or, or some of the questions I was approaching. So one of the things I'm really interested in in regards to sex work is where do these people live? Where do they work? And another way of asking that, right, is how does this person fit or not fit into the society around them? You know, where someone lives and works will also answer that question. As a background to my research that uh, I'd be happy to answer questions about or talk about at some other point, I consider Jean Glore's part of the spectrum of sex work in the Middle Ages. Uh, there are lots of good reasons for it that I'm not gonna get into right now. 
But uh, so when we look at this person balancing on swords, where might we find her in the medieval city? And I came to this question in a roundabout way because I found that my work is often noted in history or interesting things are noted in the historiography that speak to my work without being footnoted. So one of the first things I was coming across is as I was looking at these performers is that in 12th century Toulouse, there is a street called Pellardy le Jongleur, Pellardy the Jongleur, the street of Pellardy. It's named after him, he's a Jongleur. Nobody footnotes it though. Everybody's like, so interesting that this street is here, isn't that wild? And I couldn't let it go. I was like, I have to know what this is, where it is, and what is going on, because these people that I understand as a marginalized group, one of them has a street named after them. So where is it? So when I got to Toulouse in the summer of 2019, this was a question that I was really preoccupied with. And, you know, I, I saw some books that say, this is now the Rue of Pilatier, and I was really excited. I, I tried to find the photo of me standing underneath it, like, yes, look at this. This used to be the Rue of Pellardy Le Jongleur, and now it's this street and I'm standing on it. It, it means all this and it's really exciting. Uh, but then I got into the archives and as is always the case, it gets tricky once you're in the archives. So I found a book of many books again that say that that is now the Rue de Filatier. And when I went to Toulouse, fortuitously, I found an entire dissertation that was written on the Rue de Filatier. And I was like, well, that's perfect. Um, so here we can see, you know, here's Filatier, Pellardy, Le Joglar, and, and you see here it is in Latin. Um, you know, again, not really, not really clear uh, who this Pellardy is, but a jongleur. Here's like a whole dissertation on the evolution of the street. But then I ran into this problem, which is that she goes back to the 15th century and only ever finds it as the Rue of Pellardy. No joglar. So I started being a little like, oh no, what's up with that? Uh, but I also, and this will come up later, found a street called the Rue of the Joglars in general, which is also one that appears quite a bit in many different cities. A little bit like you might have a butcher street or a shoemaker street, you might have a street of jongleurs where they live. Um, so I kind of decided that something was, something was wrong here and this was emphasized. So here's a, here's a medieval map of Toulouse and I wanna focus in specifically on this area here. And I show you this kind of bigger map because we're gonna come back to it later, but right now I'm focusing in on there. And if we strip it down, here we have a recreation that was made by some archeologists who went through and tried to reconstruct 14th century Toulouse. So if you look, we have our church down here. And if we go back here uh, to this, you'll see that church is right here. So this is our Rue de Filatier here. And on the next slide, this is our Rue de Filatier here. And now we see something really interesting it's actually parallel to what they've reconstructed as the Rue of Pellardy, which is right along with the Rue de Joglar. So these archeologists are saying something very different from what these other historians are saying. And one of the things I've found a lot in my work is that this is very normal. When we're looking at sex workers, particularly people have not checked the work because they are usually referencing around them rather than them directly. So they're sort of thrown in to add color and flavor to someone else's narrative. So of course now I'm flummoxed and also obsessed and I cannot stop focusing on this. So now I'm gonna kind of show you the modern day area of Toulouse. So here is where we have our Rue de Filatier. You can see a little bit over right in this lower corner is where the church would be. 
And this is where they located uh, in this map. This is where they located that Rue de Pellardy, Rue du Canard is now the Rue de Jongleur. So what gives, right? Uh, did someone misread a map somewhere along the way was the first thing that I thought. Someone misread a map and it was the Rue de Pellardy and the Rue des Jonglers next to each other. And, you know, that, that connection was just made by a historian looking at it wrong or an archaeologist looking at it wrong. But what I found Again, just that kind of highlighting right there. If we look, we can see the filatier and the jongleur. And remember when we go back that the Rue de Jouglar is currently the Rue de, Can de Canard. So we've got a lot of muddled streets here. And if you're not following, don't worry, neither was I. Uh, at this point, again, I'm completely flummoxed and very frustrated. And what I found was I needed to focus in on the geography. And that took me to documents I was never expecting to look at in my dissertation. And those are property records. So I end up looking at, um, you'll, you'll all be happy to note, there is in fact a Rue de Pellardy Le Jouglar we see it referenced right here in a 1309 confirmation of an auction of a house that is owned by a Jew from Toulouse. Um, this house had in fact been uh, rented out before it was auctioned off, but we see in 1309 that it is for sale. And there it is, a reference that I spent better part of a year looking for. And if we come back to this, we also see some other interesting property records. And one of the things I'm going to point out is um, in relation to this particular Jew, whose name is Bon Mansip, he also has a house on the Rue of Jongleurs, the regular Rue of Jongleurs, that apparently he sells as well. So again, there's a little bit of concern about how those two are getting used, perhaps interchangeably, whether or not they're being distinguished in these documents even. But let's keep in mind that there is a Jew that was living on this street who sells that house in 1309. Now, as I look at other property records, I find in the 14th century that there is a sale uh, of two houses on Mont Carmel by the brothers Menestral, sons of Jean Menestral, a bourgeois, and they sell it to two merchants. We actually don't have a Mont Carmel, a Rue de Mont Carmel on this map, which is another problem. But we do have those brothers selling another house. So again, property records, two different records of sales of houses by the brothers Menestrels, whose last name translates to minstrels, um, who are sons of Jean Minstrel, who is a bourgeois, and they sell these houses to merchants. And previously, the houses have been rented by the Minstrels for 30 years to a butcher and a cobbler, right? So that's, and, and it says very particularly in 1401, in the second reference to the sale, that the house is on the corner of Bouquier and, wow, which I just did not pronounce like French, and the Rue de Jongleur. So right here. So if we're looking at our modern map of Toulouse, you know, we're looking, I don't know if it's appearing because, yeah, right there. So now we have a family whose last name is Minstrel in the late 14th century, early 15th century, selling two houses, one of which we know is on the corner of this Rue de Jouglar, and the other of which we know is rented out to merchants for 30 years, and then also sold or rented out to a butcher and a shoemaker for 30 years, and then also sold to merchants. So we get a sense of the demographic that's living on this street. 
and they are artisans and they are, you know, not, they're not bourgeois and the minstrels are bourgeois now. So once I kind of put this together, I was like, well, now I need to know everything about this family. And I find that in fact, the Menestrel family was only ennobled in 1342. So this is the act of ennoblement for Jean Menstrel, who then again, about 30 years later is gonna sell what I would suggest is his family home that's on the corner of the street of the Jongleurs. Now, if you've come all this way with me and you've kept any of this geography straight, I am very impressed with you. Um, but I am sure you are wondering, why does it matter, right? And to be clear, the McNally is what gave me the opportunity to find these documents. And my time using the McNally was when I pivoted to looking at the sales of these houses. So why does it matter that in 1342, the minstrel family is ennobled and then they are selling their houses, they are listed as bourgeois. It matters because this is a trend. So in 1345, we see in Mossack, we see Jacques, or I'm sorry, not in Mossack, in Narbonne, we see Jacques Joglar, a consul being paid assurances. In 1375, we see a Jean Jugular, a clerk of the diocese, and in 1577, we see a Jacques Lar consul in Mossack. So all around the south of France, we have Joglars and Menstrels who suddenly, or not suddenly perhaps, in the 14th and 15th century are being labeled as consuls, clerks, notaries, bourgeois. I would suggest that this speaks to the social mobility of this profession. And again, to get to the crux of why that is something that I am so excited about is to ask us to think about the other part of this equation. I introduced these people to you as sex workers and now I've told you that they're clerks and consuls and notaries. That's because I think that this iteration of sex work has social mobility. And we see that playing out in the urban geography of Toulouse and these other locations in the south of France. But I wanna take us back. Yeah, there's just so you can see, it's not as good uh, paleography as the other one, but that says Minestrel right there. I wanna take us back to this bigger map though. And I wanna focus in on a different area now. I wanna focus in down here at the edge of the city towards the port. And the reason I wanna focus there is because there's another group of people who are not finding that same space for social mobility in the medieval city. And that is what we think of as traditional sex workers, right? Women or men, but in this case, really mostly these refer to women selling sex on the street. And this is particularly clear in Toulouse that right in the 13th century, when these other sex workers are maybe starting to find mobility, right? They're located in the center of the old city. They're located right around here. That right around then in 1201, there's an act by uh, the Borg of Toulouse that says that all sex workers, all women who sell sex, have to leave the city. They have to live in the outskirts on the Rue des Cominges, which is right down here. And I do have to say for all of the coming maps, I am indebted to a thesis by Agathe Roby, um, who has not published it in a book yet, but it is coming. So I'm just throwing her name out there. Um, so these are the locations and we can already see they're more peripheral. And that pattern continues as well in Foix, in Grand Selve, in Pamiers, in all of these Southern French cities, we see the location of the brothels are on the outskirts, 
right, in Montauban, which is right by Toulouse. Happening simultaneously, right, by the 14th century, right around when Jean Menstrel is getting ennobled and his family is on the rise. Sex work is going to become municipalized in the south of France. They are going to start actually sort of installing municipal brothels through a series of acts. And I would liken this for uh, people today to the way that the legalization of the sale of marijuana has not actually has, has shown that the minute that a system is legal, a very specific set of people are given the opportunity to profit from it. And we see the same thing happening with sex work in the South of France, which is that the women who are engaging in sex work are not the ones who are profiting from its legalization. If anything, we see worse fates for them, including the fact that women who used to run illegal brothels, we no longer see them. We see them ending up pushed out of this business and men begin running those brothels. So this long walk of urban geography is all to say that where you live and where you work does reflect where you fit into your society, right? So these sex workers, one is relegated to the peripheries and as time marches on, they are going to continue to be a marginalized group. And the other who's sort of centered in the thriving heart of town, we see the movement that's possible for people who are integrated into their society, as opposed to these people who are left on the outskirts. So it matters because when we ask, where does this woman on the swords work and live? We have to remember to ask where this other woman works and lives. And what does that mean for the opportunities they have in the society in which they live. Thank you. All right, great. So uh, yes, different set of maps. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, if people have uh, questions or comments for Catherine based on her talk, we have a couple minutes. Matthew, yeah. I, uh, thank you to both speakers for really fascinating um, talks. And um, my uh, question is uh, for the last speaker, and it has to do with terminology. Um, you've got the term jongleur, and you also men uh, mentioned the, the um, term minstrel. Um, and I'm just wondering what are do we have kind of a hierarchy of terminology in this period? I, I work in I work in um, in Iberia, and so I'm and in one of the texts, a couple of the texts that I'm working with, I, there there um, there are there is prostitution, and and the term uh, uh, juglaresa is used um, in in one of them in particular. And I'm just and there have been some arguments that have been made about um, the status of of entertainers and their the overlap with prostitution. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about in the context that you're working with about the, the terminology and the kind of, um, are there terms that are more associated more with entertaining uh, other kinds of entertainment and, and less with prostitution? Are they all kind of, are they synonyms or? Well, I mean, I think the first issue that we run up against is there isn't there isn't a word that is uniformly used for people who sell sex, right? Um, so it's really hard because you have the word meritrix, of course, which is used in some circumstances, but actually almost somewhat rarely used in a lot of sources. They prefer, you know, women of a bad life, women who enjoy pleasure, women out during the night. So, I mean, you're, your right to point to terminology as a particularly laden thing in my dissertation in general um, and a particularly sort of sticky area. 
I would say that in terms of minstrel and jongleur, I have seen them in this time period used pretty interchangeably. Um, and their relationship to sex work, I am basing on the categorization of those groups in ecclesiastical legislation and other outlooks, the way that they are subject to a lot of the same prohibitions and legislations as other sex workers, and also kind of the way that they are portrayed in images and literature. So I'm, I don't know that I would say they are synonymous uh, with like, you know, Ameritrix, like Jongleur or Minstrel is synonymous with with Meritrix. I, I don't think that's quite right, but I, I think that it's analogous to thinking about in the 21st century, the way that we can understand an exotic dancer as a sex worker, while also understanding that an exotic dancer doesn't sell sex, but sells sexual performances. Um, and I think that that slippage in terminology that you're talking about as well uh, is kind of, is both points to the problem and is to the side of the problem as well. Uh, that these two are very interrelated in a way that it is hard to categorize. And I, because terminology is already such a big pit to step into in my project, I try not to spend too much time sort of adjudicating which uh, which term means what, because I find that every time I try to pin it down, it moves. So I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but I think it's one of those moments where um, I'm, I don't see enough of a discernible difference in my research to take the time to try and pin down whatever small difference there is between jongleur and minstrel but i would also subject that i i wouldn't say that they're meritrix i would say they're sex workers in the same way that we understand sex work as a bigger mechanism than just selling sex or sex acts great thank you so much Uh, it looks like Kay has a question, and then Maggie. Well, at least since both of these are my advisees, I, I fear I do. Uh, uh, it, I wondered if, um, you know, patronage, patronage, it seems to me, likely plays a role in the kind of social ascension that you see for, for the performers, for the jongleur. Um, and I don't know, you know, have you any means of getting at uh, patronage? Yeah, I feel like this is a trick question because we talked about my dissertation recently and I was like, I don't actually know that much about patronage. Um, I think there is means of getting at it. Uh, and it is definitely something that I think you kind of have to deal with when you're looking at performers and entertainers. Uh, it is again, another really sort of sticky subject in a lot of ways, because I think you run the risk of slipping up into town criers. Um, you know, I, th I think you run the risk of moving away from a certain type of performance that is seen as sexualized to a more illicit type of performance. And if that sounds ambivalent, that's because it is, uh, because a lot of the lawmakers and theologians in the Middle Ages are very ambivalent about, you know, what constitutes as a sexualized performance. And how do we, how do we draw a line between the performance that we look at and say, no, that's inappropriate to the performance that we say, yes, it's okay to sing in church. That's part of what we're doing. Um, so the answer is, I haven't looked at patronage much yet. I do plan to, I do also worry that starting to move immediately into that direction shifts the, the focus slightly, um, but you know, I'll, I'll have to deal with it. Thank you. All right, maybe we have time for one more question or comment. 
and it looks like Maggie has a question. Uh, Catherine, um, uh, we were in a old Occitan class together, do you remember? And um, so, yeah, and so I was really intrigued by that picture of the musicians and then the woman standing on the sword. Do you know the context of it? Were they part of a of a whole class of people that were um, musicians and acrobats and um, um, and then the level of society would be lower than, of course, bourgeois. But um, uh, do you do you know more about that? I mean, is that part of your dissertation? Is explaining that yeah. social class and and how they um, worked in the mid Middle Ages? Right. So those those performers who are singing, dancing, performing acrobatics, balancing on swords. I don't know if that one's real. <laughs> um, you know, those those are uh, those are all falling under the category of jongleur, which I don't translate because it translates literally into juggler, which uh, doesn't doesn't really work. I mean, I would translate it more into some type of public entertainer. So, um, and the context for that, it's from the Decretals of Gregory, but it doesn't really have context. It's a, it's a bas de page. So it just appears at the bottom of the page of the manuscript. And it doesn't seem totally related to the text of that manuscript page. It's just an illustration that the scribe kind of chose to make on the manuscript, which is a, a common trope in medieval manuscripts that you'll get these strange little bas de page and a lot of people have spent time trying to analyze what they mean, whether you know they're meant to be purposefully opposite of what's going on or to bring levity to a dark passage or if they're just doodlings, but um, it's not directly related to the passage. So the only context I have is is that it's there and someone drew it. Why do you think, why do you think this is a woman? Um, it's mostly the hairstyle and the outfit, uh, particularly because it, even female jongleur could wear like a type of tunic and pants. Uh, the, the acrobats would obviously be wearing a type of tunic and pants. And I think that portraying this particular figure in a dress is uh, a concerted effort at kind of gendering it. Um, I could be wrong. I mean, it is it is actually very hard to tell with a lot of these images what the, what the gender is meant to be. But um, if you look at the hair here, hang on, let me pull it up. If you look closely, you see the hair is sort of braided in the front and it seems to be up in the back. And between that and the outfit, I'm sort of interpreting it as gendered female. But a whole separate talk of my dissertation would be about how Jean Glores have an extremely fluid gender performance and that's part of the whole kit and caboodle of sex work. So, um, so that androgyny is well spotted. It is, it is a part of my project is, is dealing with that. I'd like to say one All right. thing. <laughs> uh, okay, Stephanie. So very interesting. And I think that Sheila McNally would have been delighted to have been here today. She was a very good friend of mine. And uh, I'm just, I'm really happy to, to hear both of you. And thank you so much. Thanks. And I'm actually really glad that we can um, record it too. So hopefully Sheila will be able to um, see this even if, uh, or McNally will be able to see this even if she couldn't be here as it's actually happening. So that's been one of the pluses of the of Zoom. Um, and thanks to both of you. It's exciting to hear this scholarship that's happening and um, to see the images. It's really fun to sort of um, walk through these images, I think, with both of you or have you guide us through the, through the images. And thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. And um, yeah, applause, I will do this. And I know there's a lot of virtual applause going on. And um, it's great to see everyone. And I uh, wanna mention that we have the Magda Teeter on the 18th of February for a CMS talk. Um, you can mark your
your calendars for that. We'll have Carolyn Nadeau, who does uh, food history on the 25th of February. And then we have um, several other talks. So we have our, our calendar coming together. And again, um, we also look for uh, the call for this year's McNally Fellowships. We are working on that. And so if anyone um, is considering applying, um, we will have the announcement out. And so um, mark that down. I think we have the deadline for the 15th of February. So we do plan to continue supporting um, summer research this uh, this coming summer. So thank that's you. it. So thank you. <laughs>